It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 321 of Science on Top. Today's Monday, the 17th of December, 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And sound designer and composer, Peter Miller. How are you doing? And yes, December 2018, which means it's time to take a look back at all our favourite stories of the year, which was a big one. Uh, we had rockets going into space, reusable ones, the biggest rocket ever made by a private company at the start of the year with uh, SpaceX. We then landed a probe on Mars and are about to start drilling down Yay. Mars Insight. And speaking of planets, we also found a planet orbiting a star, which was predicted by Gene Roddenberry in Star Trek. Penny, we found the real-life planet Vulcan. Yep, and <laughs> essentially for me, the name that they gave this planet is the reason that I find this interesting and unique story. So I think, you know, I think shows like Star Trek have inspired, you know, it just triggered a lot of people to be a bit interested in what's out there in the universe. I know, you know, when I was quite young, I used to enjoy watching it and it's sparked, you know, my curiosity about what's out there. Sadly, probably not Vulcans and Klingons and what have you, but um, it's it's a nice little nod to um, to science fiction and people who are writing it and creating it and, you um, it's also a nice way, I guess, to get a bit of publicity for your new uh, planet <laughs> discovery because, well, like it sounds like kind of blasé, but I mean there's so many planets being discovered these days. Like how do you get it to stand out if it's not made of diamond? So <laughs> I quite liked it. I think the new planet Vulcan was about um, twice the size of Earth and had a year of only 42 days. So... It probably wasn't habitable. We probably wouldn't find any actual Vulcans living there, but I still thought it was fun. Well, I don't know. I mean, those particular <laughs> characteristics don't mean it's uninhabitable. Um, oh, I think it was a bit close to its sun. Okay. That might make it uninhabitable. <laughs> yeah. I like I like that um, Penny just said, you know, we, we found so many planets these days. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> like, isn't that amazing? Don't you it's think so amazing. amazing. And that's like, the you thing know, like... What was it, 10 years ago? And, and people are going, hmm, I wonder whether there are going to be any planets out there. Will we and, ever find a planet even if we could? You know? uh, right. And now we yeah. know there are literally billions of planets. Yeah. Well, amazing. we know there are at least 2,200, oh, well, 2,300 or so, <laughs> you're possibly such a, as many as 3,700 that we have discovered, yes. <laughs> we, can, we can extrapolate we in can. a full scientific manner this is true. <laughs> that right. there are probably billions of planets. <laughs> yeah, well, hundreds of billions of planets. Uh, a few years so. ago, we did look at a um, study that proposed that there's probably at least one planet for every star in our galaxy, and there's at least 100 billion, possibly 400 billion stars in our yeah. galaxy. So, yeah, That is tr truly, truly, truly amazing. And we're saying it's predicted by Gene Roddenberry and they're calling it Vulcan and everything because that's actually where in, mm. at least I think it's one of the scripts or at least one of the books, yeah. uh, the planet Vulcan, the Vulcan homeworld, is around that star, however many light years away. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, and while we're in space, we might as well talk about Europa and uh, uh, <laughs> a pet topic of yours, Peter. One of my favourite places, yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, you know, the, the the story that came out this year, well, there's been a few stories about Europa, but one of the really um, interesting ones was that um, they they found, uh, well, they predicted that there was probably likely to be some uh, uh, liquid uh, water being ejected from the crust of Europa because they'd already seen that from uh, Enceladus, of course. Uh, and, and indeed, it turns out that... Um, 
the spacecrafts uh, have detected some signs of, of uh, um, particle matter that that indicates that there probably are some kinds of geysers coming out of um, the Enceladus, out of the Europa crust. So that's um, that's that's pretty cool, and I suspect that um, you know future missions are going to look more actively for that kind of stuff as well. Um, but I, you know, I, I've, I've done a project about an art project <laughs> about, about uh, Europa. Plug, plug, plug. Uh, and uh, and and uh, I, um, I think that there is a really, you know, my own personal opinion is that if there's water there, there's a really good uh, chance that we'll find some kind of life uh, on Europa. Uh, very simple life, almost certainly. But you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing for in my lifetime. That was something that was not considered to be possible water in the rest of the in the rest of the solar system when i was studying at school mm. wasn't something that anybody talked about uh, and now we know that there is a lot of water yeah it's and, in abundance and that means there's a good chance that there there is uh, some form of um very very simple life uh, in my opinion we can but hope <laughs> we can but hope uh what else did we have uh back here on earth we found uh 73,000 year old hashtag, the oldest uh, example of abstract art. Penny, what does abstract art really mean in this case? It's a few uh, slashes against a rock. <laughs> it, it's hard to say really what it means because it's hard to get into the mind of someone 73,000 years ago. I mean, I'm no art historian, but I feel like if I did some, you know, air quotes around the word, what is <laughs> art? Yeah, it'd be a difficult thing to really drill down. But um, I've always been interested by like the first kind of representations that humans were making in their environment, something that we might identify as art, even if um, in some way it had a different meaning or a different hmm. function. Yeah, so this is in the Blombus Cave in South Africa. And yeah. Like I said, it's just a few sort of random scratches. Well, they're, not, they're with ochre, really, aren't they? Just some yeah. random sort of lines. So I, haven't, I haven't heard this story. Why do they call it? Why are they kind of headlining uh, as a hashtag? hashtag. <laughs> it's, it's kind of that line, that shape. Like if you have a look at it, it is a sort of a crosshatch shape. Oh, uh, okay. But, right. I mean, that's that's something that it, obviously it's not a hashtag <laughs> in any sense that we would think of a hashtag. Or a oh, so it's not a, it's not a time traveller then? No, no. But it has been made intentionally so they would have needed to sort of grind the ochre make it make the um i think they found out it was made not just you know accidentally by grinding but it looked like it was made with something called an ochre crayon so it's not just a relic of making something else like it was someone intentionally it's, it's intentional yeah. has done this and i yeah. remember something always stuck with me one of my archaeology lecturers saying that you know some of the oldest sort of evidence of that of humans doing things like that in Australia was just in caves, like just finger marks. And, you know, when you, you rub your fingers back and forth on soft rock and make a groove, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so we don't know what these grooves were for or anything, but someone could have just been, you know, just sitting there and just making that doodling, groove and yeah. enjoying it and just doodling. And this could be similar. It could have deeper meaning. We don't know. We're not going to ever know. But... <laughs> I just think it's really interesting that, um, you know, that it's just people so long ago, it's 30,000 years older than some of the previous finds that have been mm. dubbed abstract art mm. and it's people kind of creating markings for their own purpose but using sort of shared techniques that we can still recognise today. Mm. And I just I love thinking about, you know, what it would have been like to be a human then or what it means to be a human without all the trappings of what you know our civilization and culture and but that's also what it yeah. says to me is that we we've often talked on the show about how we have this view of neanderthals and early mm. humans as being these uncultured savages and everything yeah but we're continually finding evidence of art of culture of religion of all sorts of things that mean they're not just barbarians they are yeah Intelligent and they people seem to have very complex cultures, but they just weren't done in stone. Yeah, and don't last. And yeah, yeah. Anyway, the scientific equivalent of Pixar. It didn't happen. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I do think about, like, think of all of our digital culture. I mean, mm-hmm. so much, of, like, no one's printing out archives of this and carving them on stone blocks, like. And yeah. for a lot of our digital culture, I think that's a very good thing. Probably for the best. <laughs> I'm not sure I want us to be remembered by some of the things that are on our internet, but yeah. No. But anyway. You know, that's fascinating. Hmm. And when we're talking about ancient rocks and things, we've got to remember, of course, the oldest fossils that we ever mm. found and the controversy that's erupted over them because they might just be rocks and not fossils after all. <laughs> That's fairly unfortunate. <laughs> well, it's great. It gives us a scientific debate. Yeah, yeah. I love a good back and forth kind of science story. <laughs> so these yeah. are in uh, Greenland, weren't they? These are in Greenland. And look, I'm not really down with the detailed intricacies of like how you can identify if something is a you know billions of year old fossil or if it's just a weird kind of artifact in a rock. But what I sort of liked about I liked two things about this that made me remember it was that it is one of those back and forth science. I sort of vaguely think we might have said, oh, yeah, someone's found the oldest fossils. Mm. And it's always interesting to say, well, actually, no, someone has, like, looked into this and published a paper to say, eh, I don't think so. You know, the, the evidence is not strong enough to really be convincing and I can make an equally convincing case that they're not. But the other reason I liked it is because... It just gave me a bit of perspective on the some of the real practical difficulties of doing science and even on Earth, there are places that are really hard to get to. These samples are in Greenland and I think, I can't, I'm can't. i pretty sure someone said, you know, there's areas of the deep ocean and areas of Mars that we have been able to study in more detail than this area. Like there's shocking weather, it's hard to get to, you can't stay there for a long time when you do go, get there things might be covered up in snow and so on. Mm. So that was kind of fun. It also strikes me in the case of things like this that, um, you know, there, there had to have been a time between when things were some kind of organised chemicals mm. and when there was life. And there are some theories you may know that, that say that um, the the ability for um, chemical structures like RNA to have evolved uh, were enabled by clays, by by clay formations mm. being able to make regular cl- structures. And so it stands to reason that when we look at fo- the fossil record and we go back that far in time, we're going to find a point where we can't tell the difference between yeah. things that are actually yeah. life and actually not. So, you know, maybe that's what we're looking at here. Well, in, in a way it is. I mean, it's sort of like we keep talking about the um, the missing links in evolution and people go, well, you know, you have this particular fossil and then this one, but we don't have the fossil of the animal in That's between. That's in between. That sort of thing. Yeah. Because as soon as you do find that animal mm-hmm. in between, you've then got to find the gap, the one in animal between. between those two. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Right, right, right. And at, at what point does a collection of organic mi- minerals constitute the very first sort of life when you're not going to actually well yeah when you're not actually going to be able to see a cell or anything like that it's it's an interesting almost philosophical debate i guess and even even just that that uh, concept is where you know where do we actually start the definition of life? Was it was mm. it the replicating the uh, RNA? What was that life? Well, would, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people would say that wasn't. It was just chemicals. Mm. So you know, there's going to be a boundary, right? Yep, yep. Especially when not- you look at viruses, they right. have RNA yep. as well. And but do they don't yep. reproduce on their own? They need a host cell and everything to do that in. Right. But they behave right. a lot like life in many ways. Yeah, it's fascinating. Almost as fascinating as what happens, Peter, when you eat the world's <laughs> hottest chili pepper. I, I love this story. <laughs> yeah. I, remember, I remember when it came up in my feed and I just thought my first thing was, and it's still the, the thought that lingers in my brain, and it is, why? Why would you do that? I mean, you know, there's this kind of idea. It was in a, it was a contest, wasn't it? This was a, a guy who was competing in a contest an internet dare or something uh, to see who could eat 
uh, the most of these particular um, peppers, which were called um, Carolina Reaper. I mean, isn't it in the name? <laughs> Reaper. <laughs> Jeez, don't you actually just think for a minute about doing that? Um, and uh, yes, this this poor chap uh, uh, scoffed down. Um, I'm not even sure how many of these these Reaper chilies. Don't that think he ate. you'd need a lot. <laughs> uh, apparently, it was enough to cause him to go into some fairly serious medical uh, trauma, hmm. uh, in- including something which just freaks the hell out of me, and that is thunderclap headaches. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I think to myself, okay, you know what? I'm really happy with uh, my kind of like mild curry. That that's good. <laughs> I, I, like, I like that. But the the thunderclap headaches from the the um, Carolina Reaper. No, I think I'm just just gonna. So excruciating headaches, but accompanied by dry heaving, nausea, vomiting, right. and right. all these other things, as well as potential death uh, from blood clots and uh, heart attacks right. and things. It's right. Well, apparently they did it. You know, they 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 actually did some scans of his brain, and um, because he wasn't actually showing any kind of like chemical problems in his blood, mm-hmm. but they thought, well, well, we'll stick him into a you know into a CT machine and just have a look, and uh, it turns out that um, he was suffering from major vasoconstriction, mm-hmm. which is the 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 um, vessels in his brain had just kind of more or less just closed right down, uh, and this was what they speculate was the cause of these thunderclap headaches. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, and, and obviously these chilies are doing something which no one quite understands, um, but having, having this uh, significant effect on your uh, vein system. Yeah. Uh, probably, probably an interesting experiment. Maybe there's something we can learn out of that. At some <laughs> Good luck getting I, past an ethics board. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't think that that chap is going to be uh, – Doing it again. Just in Carolina Reapers. In <laughs> and of course, at the time, I think that was the most, uh, the hottest known chili, but there have, of course, been several since then that are even worse, like Pepper uh, X and Dragon's Breath. So um, if you course. see that, if anyone yeah, offers run, you one of them, gonna, I'd pass. They're going to run out of names eventually. <laughs> I mean, you can only go so far up that scale, really, can't you? Well, then you end up with NASA's situation where you go, the very, very, very hot chili. <laughs> <laughs> the really, really, really deadly one. <laughs> well, they have a, there is a, an actual measurement, you know, it's called the Scoville scale where they measure the heat of chilies. I, don't, I actually don't know what the, what the Carolina Reaper ended up being, but it was, it was no doubt fairly high. <laughs> I can tell you that it was 2.2 million on the oh, okay. scale. scale. Uh, I don't know what the reference is, but that sounds pretty bad to me. I think um, your typical jalapeno is about 10,000 on the scale. Okay. Well, I yeah. had one of those a couple of, couple of days ago, so I, I'm, I've got a bit of measure. No, that was hot enough. No thunderclap headaches? <laughs> Good to hear. <laughs> I think I had to have a glass of water afterwards, though. Fair enough. Well, you know what, what might cause some headaches for uh, some lizards in the Caribbean? And that's hurricanes. And uh, we did talk about after Hurricanes Maria and Irma, uh, they were noticing that these lizards that uh, live on the trees and that had developed a nifty way of not getting swept out to sea and uh, drowning. How do they... Was that called, was that called hanging on for dear life? <laughs> It yeah. Was. All right. It was. Yes. All right. Steal my thunder. <laughs> I'm just guessing. I didn't see that story, but I it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But this is like an evolutionary uh, method of surviving, isn't it, Penny? Yeah. This was really fun because it was one of those other fortuitous things that the actual study, as it started, was looking at the effect of um, getting rid of rats on the island and how that might affect the evolution of the lizards. So it just happened that before the hurricanes, um, the liz- there had been a, quite a comprehensive study done of dozens of li- lizards and measurements of their bodies, legs and toes. Then the hurricanes hit. And so the question is, you know, did those body measurements, which are those things that evolution can work on, you know, size, shape and so on, have an impact on how the lizards survived? And what they found is that, the ones that were surviving after the hurricane had bigger toe, pad, toe pads and longer front legs. 
there's no evidence that they grew or anything by that amount. It just seems that what happened is that the storms wiped out the ones that had smaller toe pads and shorter legs. And what was kind of cute is the way they tested, you know, how do we know this is or how could this be because of the hurricane? So they got a big leaf blower and <laughs> they, they put lizards on little wooden posts and Those blew poor the, lizards. The poor little <laughs> lizards. But they um they put on the um the lizards on the leaf post and blew them with the leaf blower. The lizards would shell, you know, shimmy around to the back and tuck themselves in and cling on. But what they found is that their their big thighs would catch the wind and act like a sail. So having um you know bigger toes to cling on, bigger front legs was was quite good. So. It was quite, I, I like this, I remembered it because often you're like, really, really, mm-hmm. just like a 2% difference in toe pad size really help you survive a hurricane, but at a population level, yeah. yes, it does. So I like this. It's a real nice data. And how can you ever get data before a hurricane and after? It was so fortuitous. By it? accident, essentially. <laughs> yeah. 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 But also, you got to remember that two percent difference is really only after one generation one or maybe two. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, so. evolution is a numbers game. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it's pretty special. Well, speaking of the marvels of evolution, let's go to another <laughs> uh, animal and another mystery solved in 2018. One of those mysteries that we've you know been plagued with for so long, haven't we, Peter? Is that why? Do wombats poop in cubes? This is a fantastic <laughs> mystery. Do you know? I, I used to I used to have a, a little piece of land up on the on the western side of the Blue Mountains, and uh, we had wombats on our property, and uh, and we would see the the cubical wombat poo quite often, and it was always fascinating because you kind of, and also the other thing that they they don't actually say too much about uh, in in this story when it's been reported, but wombats also poo on kind of like conspicuous places so they they quite often do their poo on a like on a rock on the side of a path or or you know somewhere where you could kind of quite easily see it mm-hmm. and apparently this is part of the thing as well they, they, and they and they do actually make their their feces in a in a cubic shape uh and it's um believed that, that they do it for a few reasons um one of them is that it doesn't roll away. So where they mark their territory, it actually stays there and you can actually, um, uh, another wombat coming past will actually find, oh, you know, this is where so-and-so lives. I'll just keep well clear of this this kind of area. Um, but uh, one of the mysteries, of course, was h- how do they do this? You know, how do they actually make um, their, their um, feces in a in a cubic shape because it seemed particularly um, uh, comfortable nor normal. Um, and but they it, don't have square butts. And they don't have, yeah, just like all animals, they they have a sort of a, a round opening. So uh, how, how does that happen? Well, it turns out that they uh, their intestines have a particular kind of um, uh, tautness and stretchiness uh, that allows it to, to form allows the feces when it goes through to form these kind of cubic shapes, which is kind of fascinating, I think. I have a, I have another story too because one of the reasons that I found this fascinating when it came out was because only a few weeks before I had some American friends staying here and we went for a walk uh, down on the coast near Melbourne and we saw some uh, some wombat poo and, and I said I said this this is wombat poo they they actually do make their 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 feces in cubic shapes and and one of the friends of mine Mary just looked at me and she just thought oh my goodness mm-hmm. it's just it's just another one of those Australian don't like- go on yeah. about the drop bears <laughs> next <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. come on and- everyone knows drop bears do triangular poos <laughs> right exactly. <laughs> So it was with great satisfaction that I was able to kind of link this to them uh, on their Facebook and say, "See, it was true all along. <laughs> I was it wasn't bullshit. It was wombat shit. <laughs> <laughs> it was wombat shit." <laughs> nice so a, fan, a fantastic story, but you know, a long time coming, really, when you think about it, because uh, we've only 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 this year found mm. out what this is. <laughs> And, and so I, you can go for a bushwalk and you will see, look for, for look for rocks in wombat areas and you will see on the rocks, nice and neatly placed, <laughs> will, be, will be these little cubicle uh, wombat poos. 
I did like that when this story came out, I saw it on my Facebook and my, just all my social media profiles. I saw so many people going, hey, American friend, told you, see? <laughs> <laughs> because well, they all thought we were having yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great story. I love it. It's very cool. Uh, and I think let's uh, finish up now. And one of the stories that I know you liked particularly, Penny, was all about how we could look at ice core samples and they are so detailed that we can look at the sort of industrial and economic boom through the Roman Empire and therefore also that economic fall as well. The Roman Empire, after 2,000 years, we can tell this in ice cores. That's very cool. It's really cool. It's got two of my favourite things coming together, which is, you know, ancient history, archaeology, ice cores, a bit of geo, you know, all that kind of stuff and to make a big picture. One of the things about the Roman Empire is we know a lot about, you know, certain aspects of it because that was what people wrote down and also thought was worth recording and copying for the next 2,000 years. But we don't have so many, you know, account books or sort of economic projections or whatever. So we we know a lot about, you know, certain kinds of political events, but not as much about the economics and how that actually worked as an economy, obviously very different to our own. But what we see in this story is that you can actually track lead pollution using ice cores. And in when the Roman Empire was quite peace, peaceful and prosperous, um, you see lead pollution rise, which seems to have something to do with making, you know, the economic activity. So things like, you know, making water pipes, making hulls of boats, but also um, producing silver coins and prosperous societies producing more silver coins um, and so on. So the more silver production, separating it from lead, the more lead pollution, when there's less silver production, you see a sort of decline. So, and what you can actually see when you track the, um, the lead pollution is that it tends to decline during times when we know there was a lot of conflict and discord and crisis in the Roman empires. Um, it seems to recover a bit judging by lead levels and then declines, you know, around 500 AD ballpark when the, um, the Western Roman empire kind of gave up the ghost hmm. so it's not like you can say oh it's it's a one-to-one -one thing like more lead pollution great economic health less lead pollution it's kind of like that you know well probably it's a bit better than that whole idea of skirt length of women in fashion as a proxy <laughs> but it's, it's something that you can use to say well we don't it's have an indicator direct yeah. data it's an indicator that you can use as part of a bigger picture and I really envy the scientists working on this because they get to bring together so many different sort of strands of human knowledge and tie them together, work with people from other disciplines. It must have been a really interesting study to work on. I just like we, when you can match up like known points that we had. Mm. You know, we know mm. how the empire was doing in this particular time. Yeah. And then you can match that with a correlation that fits it so well and you just have these these fixed points in time to use a Doctor Who phrase, but you have those <laughs> fixed points in time that we know about yeah. and that they correlate so much. And then you can go, well, what's this peak or this trough here? Yeah, I what, wonder what, what was going be? on there. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's fun. I love it. <laughs> it's like showing you where to look, you know, maybe if we yeah, focus exactly. our historians on this sort of thing, we might learn things. Yeah. But uh, there was one story that I think we came towards the end of the year and I think was also really, really huge. And uh, this is my favourite for all the wrong reasons, really. <laughs> right. And that is that is the world's first genetically edited oh. human babies, uh, which I don't think we've still seen any actual evidence that they were genetically edited. We assume they are. It all seems to indicate that that was the case. But so many things about this scream, red flag, scream, don't do this. Work done without any uh, oversight from an institution or legal board, no ethical uh, considerations taken into place, lack of consent in many respects with the parents of these babies. 
and also lots of actual scientific doubt as to whether or not it was successful, as to whether his technique was uh, up to scratch. There's, it, it looks like one of them at least may have sort of a mosaicism, which is where some of the genes are immune to HIV, which is what he was working towards, and some of them aren't. And if any of them aren't, then really there's no immunity. So that's kind of useless. It's, it's just one of those things that, yeah, if you'd done it right, it would be one of the most significant groundbreaking studies of the time. But because you went about it in the wrong way, because it was rushed, because it wasn't done at the right time and in the right manner, it's now a, a black mark against the technology. And there's a lot of concern that regulation is going to kick back and we're going to have more difficulty in doing CRISPR or gene editing with humans. Yeah, it's so many things. There's another problem too. I don't know whether you saw just uh, in, in uh, my feed in the last couple of days um, where they're talking about how this particular gene that he's altered, uh, whilst it will possibly have some effect uh, in um, HIV, um, actually administrate certain other things as well. Uh, and so these children uh, are likely to have other medical problems, um, which in fact may well be greater uh, than, than the HIV, HIV um, that they may have inherited mm. from, from their mother. Well, so, no, um, sorry, the father had HIV. Not and, from their father, and, I'm sorry. And they weren't going to inherit it, but they were... We think he specifically targeted fathers that had HIV and mothers that didn't so that they would be f more likely to be exposed to the HIV virus in order I to see. test it. And that right. in itself is an ethical <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's ethically disaster. Prob problematic, isn't but, it? But, but it's, you know, it's, it stands to reason. I mean, we know uh, that, that our uh, genetic um, code has a certain number of... Um, elements to it and we know that it must somehow encode for the full complexity of a human being which can't be described just on a on a one-to-one -one basis from the number of genes that we carry you know so these genes have got to be working uh, in very complex ways with one another uh, and so when you start to do that kind of alteration, it, it might seem convenient that, you know, oh, this gene codes for this particular thing, but it probably codes for many other things as well. So you really can't tell what you're doing when you do that kind of work. Yeah. So the genes that he had uh, edited into these uh, babies were, uh, uh, it's a mutation of, a C of the CCR5 gene. That's and right. people who have that mutation naturally have an immunity to HIV, but they're also more susceptible to West Nile virus and more likely to die from the common winter influenza. Right. So he's plus taken... The, plus these are people who've lived to a certain age and are, you know, healthy people. You don't know mm -hmm. that, that certain other aspects of their genetic code have actually shored up problems in that particular gene. Sure. Because they're, they're survivors. So you don't know what will happen to children or babies when they have those kinds of, of alterations. The genetic um, code is not understood in that, at that kind of depth. So it's, um, it's incredibly irresponsible of him to do it. Yeah. And I'm all in favour of human gene editing and CRISPR and all that sort of stuff. But when it's done right, and this is the good thing about this is that it is now sparked a lot more discussion about where we go with this. Uh, where are we as a society comfortable with human gene editing? Are we okay with editing out, you know, the serious diseases, the, the um, Huntington's diseases and things like that? Are we then okay with, well, you're not guaranteed to get HIV. It's very easily managed if you do get HIV. It's not life and death necessarily. Are we okay with combating that? And how, where do we draw the line? Where do you get uh, designer babies of, I want them taller, blonde haired, blue eyed, whatever it is. Right. These are discussions that as a society we need to have. And that's what the conference that he was at when he announced this was all about. Yeah. Yeah. But didn't he, hadn't he written a paper about ethics he had, as well? <laughs> yeah, and given a talk Which, and saying, don't do this. And then a year later he went and did that. Is that's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, you know, he he was so he's he's it's even worse in some ways in in respect to the fact that he 
understood what he mm. was doing, mm. uh, and he did it anyway. And we are talking about Jiang Kui He, uh, in case people aren't familiar with the story. And the, the alarming thing is, there's all sorts of rumours that he has since gone missing. Uh, no one's heard from him for some time. Uh, there's talk that he's been arrested by the Chinese government. Chinese government haven't said that they are or anything. And we don't know if he's fled, if he's gone into hiding. It's one of those stories that just gets getting weirder and weirder as you follow it. So I'm sure that's something that we'll be doing a lot yeah. in 2019. I don't think that's the end of that story, that's for sure. No. But it is the end of this show. Uh, we will, of course, have all the links to all those stories on the web at scienceontop.com slash 321. And a very big thank you to all our Patreon supporters. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to help us out. We are still in the midst of our 10-episode campaign, I guess you'd call it, where we're donating uh, all our Patreon revenue to to uh, charities, Doctors Without Borders and the Fred Hollows Foundation in memory of a good friend of ours, Penelope Green, who passed away from lung cancer in November. As I said, a good personal friend, but also a listener to the show. So we're doing that in her honour. Scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to be a part of that. We will be taking a break over January and we'll return in February with some small changes that we've got in the works at the moment. But in the meantime, of course, we'll have our bloopers episode coming out shortly. So thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope your 2019 is full of good health, good cheer and excellent science. And thank you, Penny and Peter, for another great show. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And we'll be back, as I said, in February, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. <laughs>